God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Lord, we thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord God, for the gift you gave to Solomon when he asked you what it was, when you asked him what he wanted. And he could have asked for wealth, he could have asked for anything, but he asked for wisdom. And so tonight, Lord God, we make the same request that Solomon made, that you give us wisdom. Add to that knowledge and understanding of your word, Father God, that we may be hearers of your word and doers of your word. But more than that, Father God, that this would be the grout, the cement in our relationship with you that bonds us with you, that we would be of one mind, one heart, and one spirit with you, Lord God. And that we would understand in terms that were your original language, your original expressions and what they mean and why they mean it and why it's important for us to understand it. So Lord God, motivate us to hunger and to desire to know you more. Father, I ask for your hand on this teaching. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O God, as we dedicate this time to you in the precious and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so we're in Genesis 3. And we're in this time when we're looking at the curses. So, of course, the covenant in Eden was broken. The very first covenant that God made was broken. And that covenant was with Adam. And that was uh, a covenant that he could have dominion over everything, but they just couldn't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, and he goes down the line. And he first, he talks to uh, the woman, then he talks to Satan, and then he talks to Adam uh, in, these, in these consequences, all right? And now we're in the second part of the consequences for the woman, and uh, childbearing will be painful. Now, she had not had children before this, so it wouldn't be anything to com be, that she could compare it to, but this is our message for today because we continue to realize that God is presenting us to picture of what is. At the time he's giving this message to Moses, he's explaining to Moses why childbirth is painful. He's giving him an understanding that he can share as he records this message from God that God's revealing to him and now he's writing it out. And so it's gotta make sense to Moses as to how they arrived at the place that they arrived and the story that was unfolding as to the complete, the exodus, right? All that transpired during that time up until the point in which he could reveal to him, explain to him why he was doing what he was doing. So it's not until after Exodus chapter 12 that Moses is actually living out and recording, right? Now he's, he's, he's you know, living through, but uh, these instructions are coming from from God, but prior to this, these are instructions that are as applicable today uh, as it was back then that, that telling, saying to the woman that the second provision is pain, you shall bring forth children. Birth will now involve pain. Had she given birth before the, Paul, the, before the fall, it would have been without pain. John 16, 21 states that once birth takes place, she has joy. And 1 Timothy 2.15 states that a woman shall be saved by childbearing. This does not refer to spiritual salvation, but to the fact that a woman is saved from her seeming, seemingly inferior status by her ability to give birth, thus sustaining human existence. You remember, barrenness was looked upon as a curse. Even today, barrenness is looked upon as a curse. I have many guests talk about infertility and how they took on the identity of the barren Sarah. They took out the identity of the barren Hannah. They took out the identity of the barren women of the Bible thinking that they were under a curse, that God, that they went into this marriage ready to have a family, it was time to have a family and they couldn't conceive and they immediately went into this self-loathing, self unworthiness, deep slippery slope and to be defining by the ability to give birth to a child. And many of them found that there was a reason, whether or not it was through adoption or it was through support, 
that uh, they hung on to the words of Genesis 50, that what the enemy would mean for evil, God would work for his good so that many would be saved, and they found their comfort in re reconciling with God why they didn't have children. Many of you know my Hebrew name is Avraham, father of many nations. I have no biological children. How could I be named prophetically Abraham and have no biological children? I have an adopted daughter, but I have no biological children. There was never any reason given as to why I never had children. I actually didn't want children. I didn't want to be like my father. And since I was the last in the line that bore the name because the name was changed, so I'm the last walker there is, what did I want to leave behind as a legacy? And I, I didn't want to be the present absent father. Okay, and what's a present absent father? Well, it's a father that lives in the home, but he's married to his work. Well, I was married to my work. Right? So I traveled all over the world. My father traveled all over the world. He was gone more than he was home, and the dynamic was very, very different. I didn't want that. So I didn't know whether or not I was bondable, that I could bond with a child. Oh, nieces and nephews, and, and you know, a fun time of playing with them for an hour or two, but the full-time responsibility and the nurturing and all those things. Well, I wound up getting thrown into it as a solo parent uh, after a man, uh, three years after Amanda was adopted uh, and became a full-time parent. So God threw me into it. But, you know, I've had a lot of spiritual children and I've nurtured a lot of spiritual children. And all over the world, uh, there are families and people that I call families. So I have become the father to many from a spiritual perspective that have been sitting under my teaching and under the ministry for a long time. But our definition, especially for women, is the ability to bear children. Uh, sometimes uh, they want more than one child and they can't conceive a second child. And so uh, they have to reconcile with that aspect of infertility. Sometimes they can't conceive at all and they go through the whole spectrum of fighting the battle of infertility, which is incredibly painful, incredibly expensive. You must be incredibly co committed to it. Uh, but if you're defining yourself as, as a mother and you can't be a mother, then what happens? You know, when you ask a person, tell me about yourself, a man always tells you what he does. A woman always tells you about her family. Wife always says, well, this is my husband, Dale, my son, Seth, you know, we we, you know, I used to work for the phone company, we married for 47 years and, you know, 40, 45 years, okay, 45 years, okay? Yeah, I'm not trying to make you older, it's, but married 45 years, you know, good stable family, you know, long standing marriage and <clears throat> in spite of Dale. Uh, but when you ask Dale, tell me about yourself, well, I, you know, I, I uh, run a dump truck business and, um, you know, I do this and I do that. And it's what I do. Men define by what they do. Women define by their family. Well, so what if you don't have a story to tell because you are married, but you have no children? And so where do you fit in? And how do you tell that story? And do you find support? So this was, uh, first of all, it was validating that a woman could fulfill the purpose she was designed for. The animals were told to be fruitful and multiply, and now she was told to be fruitful and multiply, and there was a reason for that, and that was because you have to repopulate the earth, because now death is entered the picture. You know, it wasn't so important to have a big population or a lot of reproduction of human beings when there was no death. You had a number of, you had a, whatever the family number was, let's say it's 25, and, that's a, that's, that's a big enough family, and that runs the Garden of Eden forever, and you're in fellowship with God, and you don't need to populate the earth. But when death came in to the picture, you had to have genealogies and lineages, and you had to have people 
and reproduce. So the third provision is your desire shall be to your husband. The Hebrew word for desire is only used twice elsewhere. In Genesis 4, 7, where there's a desire to rule, and in the Song of Solomon 7, 10, where it talks about sexual desire. The woman will desire to rule over that which is to master her, just as sin desired to rule over Cain, who should have mastered it. The point is a desire to possess. Eve will be placed under Adam's authority, but she'll desire to supersede that authority. She chose to act independently of the man, and now she will have a desire to rule and to possess him, a desire to control the man, to dispute the headship of the husband. Okay? Everything that was in the creation story was separated. Remember I told you that not only is it the creation, one and a half chapters, but it's an entire separation and genealogies, generations. So we look at this separation, the water still tries to make it back to the shore even though he separated the water from the land. Okay? The rains come down, the heaven comes down in the form of rain wanting to return to the earth. Uh, we left God and have a desire to return to God and the woman is taken out of the side of the man and, and wants to return to be at one for this reason a man will leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife and they shall become one. The dynamic between the two often becomes friction. If it's a strong woman, okay? I had a great grandmother that was four foot six by four foot six. Okay? She was a strong woman. Okay? I have pictures, and I can't tell you if she's sitting down or standing up, but she, but, but, but she was cubical. Okay? Old Russian, real heavy stock Russian blood, four foot six by four foot six and she ruled the roots. Now Judaism is matriarchal, not patriarchal. You know, there's a, a story about a young Jewish boy comes home and said, I got a, um, a, a part in a play. And uh, uh, they asked what the part was and uh, he was supposed to play the part of, uh, of Joseph, the Jewish husband of Mary, right? And she said, no, you need to go back and try to get a speaking part. Husbands don't have a speaking part. <laughs> okay. So uh, when you look at this, this is where the source of conflict, when I used to do marital counseling, it was, you know, the, the decision always came down to, would you rather be right or be happy? And will this matter in six months? Will this matter in a year? And it won't matter in a year what difference does it make, all right? But if you find that one's always yielding and there is no balance in the yielding, well, then that causes friction. You know, I'm always the one to give in. You know, you, it, always, it is always going to be your way. So I don't need, so now I act like I don't care. Well, because I don't, because why should I express my opinion when it's gonna get shot down anyways? Because I know it's not gonna matter in a year, but why don't you sometimes let it not matter to you my way? You know, so, you know, there's, these are some of the discussions. So the fourth provision is he shall rule over you. Now, this is uh, actually tomorrow at noon. We're doing an interview called The Handmaiden's Conspiracy. And it is how the Greek of the New Testament in regards to women has been mistranslated and misapplied. And it's a factual, this is not a woman who's got a grudge and says that a woman should be the head of a church and she should be this and she should be that. Here's what the scriptures actually said, here's the real translation. And here's in defense of this conspiracy to subjugate women, all right, to treat women as chattel. Now in the Old Testament, women were treated as chattel. All right? And it was very simple to get a divorce. All you had to do was walk around your wife three times proclaiming, I divorced thee, I divorced thee, I divorced thee, you go get, go get another wife, okay? Because it was for the purpose of childbearing. It was the purpose in this design. Uh, people today um, really take it to heart and the husband rules over the wife and we have to deal with spousal abuse and verbal abuse and emotional abuse and all these other things where they have this Archie Bunker mentality that a woman is less than uh, but yet they were created to be one. 
So how can the wife be less than the husband if they're one? They would be a house divided against itself, and scripture clearly says a house divided against itself cannot stand. But it says he shall rule over you, and this is in the scripture, the husband is now to rule over his wife. She is to be in subjection to the husband, the husband is to rule the wife. The Hebrew word for rule is mashal, which means more than just the love and leadership roles. It refers to dominance, mastery, and lordship. Adam is to rule over her as he was to rule over sin. Because she led her husband to sin, now she must be mastered by him. This does not mean that before the fall that they were on a co-equal authority basis. Even before the fall, that there was a subordination of the wife to the husband, just as there was the subordination of the son to the father. Now, why did God put us in that role where, first of all, you read the New Testament called no man rabbi. Well, the actual translation is called no man master. You have one master. He goes on to explain why you call no one rabbi, because at the time, the Pharisees were masters. They wanted to be treated as masters, and the people were subjugated to that. And so I get these emails all the time, why do you have an ordination as a rabbi when it says call no man rabbi? I said, well, I've never told anybody to call me master, but if you would like to be the first, um, I, I'm fine with that, you know. Um, you know, there's nobody that's ever been subjugated to me. I've never been the Lord and master and the Lord over. It's not how love is expressed. It actually says esteem the other more than yourself. So you've got to take the entirety of scripture, but you have to look at the order and we serve a God of order. Somebody has to come first. Okay. We serve a God of the ordinal and the cardinal. Okay. So we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay. We also have God the Father. Then we have the man. Now the man is supposed to be the head of the household. Doesn't often do a good job, but I want you to picture what the role of the man was. Because when you understand the role of the man, you'll understand some concepts. Right? Before the family went to sleep at night, the, the fire dies down in the center of the home. You gather around the warm fire. The wife goes, she gets tucked in, the husband walks out the door and he goes, checks the wall before he turns in for the night. And if he finds a breach in the wall, he tries to repair it, reset the stones in the wall so the wild animals or an enemy cannot come through. However, if the breach is too big, he has the responsibility to do what? Stand in the gap. Now, you hear that term all the time thrown around the church is, you know, I'm going to stand the gap for you, stand the gap for you. Okay, that means I'm going to come between you and an ongoing wild animal. Remember, we're talking about lions, tigers, bears, oh my. We're talking about wild animals, okay, at this time, okay, uh, Daniel, lion, Samson, lion, Daniel talked about lions and bears. Okay, this is the time of, this is... Remember, you're, you're in Israel, but you're so close to Africa, okay? And you don't have the civilizations that drove out the habitats of these animals. So the husband was required to stand there all night long in the gap as a buffer. Well, for that responsibility, he gets the honor, okay? His life is on the line. Okay, he's the one that goes to battle. Women stay home, man goes to battle. He puts his life on the line. He's also be the spiritual head of the household. So if God is going to discipline the household, who does he start with? The man. I always show picture that people this picture. If your family is not lined up, then God has to spend time going, come on, Johnny, get in line. I can't deal with your father until I get everybody lined up behind dad. Okay. Same way with the congregation. Okay. If the congregation is not lined up behind the pastor, behind the vision, behind the word of God, then God's too busy trying to get people lined up. He can't ever speak to the pastor because he's so busy trying to get things in order. But once things are in order, that man is the prophet of the congregation. He's God's anointed. He's God's chosen one. Right? And I can tell you, I've been in the situation, there's a... Uh, uh, I did a fresh oil, uh, fresh anointing, fresh oil. Of, it's, it's some gathering that's in Centerpoint or Trustville or out that way. And I came with a message fully prepared. 
and I open my Bible and I always have notes that are the same size as my Bible page, so you think I'm looking at a Bible page, but I don't actually ever use my notes. I never have, but I've always been in the habit of having them. Maybe it's just reinforcement, but it's there. I, and I always read from the Bible. So you always see me when I'm preaching, I come over here, I'm talking to you, and then I go back to the podium and I read from the text. I always read straight from the Bible. I don't quote it because I don't want to misquote it because oftentimes you're in the heat of the moment, you misquote it. Wrong chapter and verse, well, you get the phone call. Uh, you left out two words, you get the phone call. So I would always have it right there in front of me. But this night I had a message prepared and I get up there and I open in prayer and I take the notes and I pick them up and I say, this is the message that I prepared for you. And I threw it over my shoulder and said, the Lord's just told me that's not the message he wants me to preach. Open your Bibles and I never, anybody who's ever heard me preach has never heard me say these words. Open your Bibles and turn with me to page such and such. Okay. Not my style of hermeneutics or not my style of homiletics or whatever, whatever apologetics, uh, apoplexy, whatever it is, it's just not the way I preach, is turn with me. That's a, a, a systematic seminary approach to the opening. That, that wasn't my style. Uh, but this time, because that's all I had was what God told me to read and take them on a journey through that text. Well, the response was they had never seen anybody ever do that before. And I said, this is a gathering of a move of the spirit and the spirit just moved and you're telling me you've never seen that before? Yeah, I heard from the Lord on Wednesday when I wrote this message that this is what I was supposed to write. Okay, well, it's now Friday night and God says, no, nope. all right. I've looked around, I've examined the population, and here's the message I want you to preach. I didn't know anything about them. I was a guest speaker, but God knew them. He knew what they needed to hear. And I can tell you that every person came up to me afterwards and said, that's exactly the message I needed to hear tonight. Well, that's when the Holy Spirit moves. Well, if you can deal with the head, then the body lines up wonderfully. If you want to kill a snake, you cut off the head. All right, if you want to edify the body, what do you do? You put a crown on the head. So God's always dealing with the head. It's not always a place of honor. And it's not always easy being the spiritual head of the household, but it is one which we are assigned and God's gonna hold us accountable for it. The new element is that of her subjection with the man exercising lordship, mastery and dominance coupled with her desire to rebel against him. According to the rabbis, and I share this with you only because of my upbringing and my training. And remember that I was with the rabbis studying the writings of the rabbis before I studied the Bible. I didn't become a Bible student until after I came to the Lord. Okay? I was much more raised in what you would consider to be the commentary. That's why I always talk about, read the Bible. You know, have a concordance, have a dictionary, but read the Bible, okay? You need a little help with the word, have a concordance. But having a commentary, you become enamored with the commentator and his point of view. So according to the rabbis, now which rabbis? I can list off 25 or 30 contributors to this uh, from the Talmud that there were the Talmudic writings, but the woman was cursed with 10 curses. First, menstruation happens to be on a 28 day cycle tied to the lunar calendar, right? And so 28 day cycle, God's of God of consistency. Things are on his cycle, not our cycle. We just have to remember and line it up. What else is on a 28 day cycle? The moon. Well, that's how the Hebrew calendar was set. A woman's cycle was set that way. Uh, secondly, bleeding as a virgin. Thirdly, the discomfort of pregnancy. Fourthly, miscarriage. Fifth, the pains of childbirth. Sixth, the anguish of raising children. Seventh, the covered head. 
Eighth, subjection to her husband. Ninth, forbidden to testify in court. And tenth, death. Now one of those is to your benefit. A wife cannot be compelled to testify against her husband in court. That's still the law of the land today. A wife cannot be compelled to testify against her husband. A husband cannot be compelled to testify against his wife. Isn't that interesting that that's maintained as one of the things that you would find as being one of the subject, sub subjections. Now, what happens when we come to the story of Deborah the judge? Well, we find that God is not circumstantial or opportunistic. God is the one who calls those to rise to certain occasions. Now, there was no one to fill that job. And so Deborah stepped up. Was she rejected in that position? She was not. Therefore, there is no defense whatsoever to say that we see a pattern in the Bible where without the woman taking a position like Liel driving a spike through the brain of her captor, we don't see Rahab okay, being the Cory Ten Boom. The first Cory Ten Boom was Rahab. Okay? She was the first to provide the hiding place. Cory Ten Boom was only patterned after Rahab. Yes, think about it, okay? Make sense? So did God honor that? God did honor that, what did he do? All right. Rahab is in the lineage of Messiah. Here she was considered Rahab the harlot, okay? But when you're in the will of God, doing the will of God, God will elevate you and take you out from that subjugation, or take you out from this curse, okay? First of all, generational curses. Think about what the Bible says. It says the sins of the father will be visited upon the children to the, to the what? To the third and fourth generation of those who hate him. But his blessings will extend to a thousand generations of those who love him. So how can you be under both a blessing and a curse? we deal with it every day. Or under the blessing. They were under the blessing for 40 years in the desert. They were under a blessing. But yet 3,000 died. Right? Because they walked in their own flesh. You can walk, you can, you can be the most blessed person in the world and be under the curse of a sin. Right? Not repent of it. And guess what? All of a sudden all your wealth goes away. You know, what the wealthy man that comes to Jesus and says, how do I get saved? He says, you give away your idols. What was his idol? Money. Okay. Oh, I know the word and I do this and I do that. He goes, yeah, but you've got to give everything away. Okay. That was his idol. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. Ule Adam amar ki shemata lekol ish techa. Vetakal mincha etz asher tzviticha lemor lo tokal mimenu arura haadama. Bavarecha betvaun toklena kol yeme chayeha. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake, and sorrow shall you eat of it all the days of your life. Vekots vedar dartats miach lach veakal veakalta et eseb hasadeh. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. Bezet ata pecha, tochal lechem a shuvachal el hadama, ki me nalu 
כך תא, כי עפר אתה ואל עפר תשוב. In the sweat of your face shall you eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So, how did these curses proceed? He started by cursing first the serpent. Then he cursed the woman. Then he cursed the man. Now, how hard is a field to plow? Pretty hard. Cursed is the earth. It's hard to get things to grow and keep it growing and keep the right nutrients. Make sure that in the drought, what, how do you water it in the drought? How do we, you know, what happens to the crops here? We read the farm reports and say, well, we lost the whole peach crop because of the drought, or we lost the whole strawberry crop because of the frost. Okay. What is that farmer going to do for a living? Okay. He worked that ground until the sweat of his brow till he came in. He got up early in the morning and came to, to the table. Still overheated, still worked hard, and ate his meal in a hurry because he had to get to bed because he had to get up at the crack of dawn to go back out to work that field. So the fourth and last category under the Adamic covenant involves Adam, beginning with the cause in verse 17a. And unto Adam he said, because you have hearkened unto the voice of your wife and eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it. The covenant is made between God and Adam. Just as he did with the Edenic covenant, Adam again stands as the representative head of the human race. The text says, because you have hearkened unto the voice of your wife, this showed clear failure of his headship. Then comes the judgment upon Adam, which is also a judgment on it all. It is Adam, a judgment on all humanity. It is Adam, not Eve, who is held responsible for the present human condition. This category contains a total of four specific provisions of God's judgment on humanity. Sin was committed by Adam. Could he have stopped her from touching? Could he stopped her from eating? He might not have been able to stop her, may not have been there when she took from the tree, but he was there when she ate of the tree. Could he have not held out his arm and said no? And he had the headship. He was given the position and he did not exercise his authority. I think I shared the story with you and I'll share it again. When I got promoted by AT&T to go out to California, I inherited a very large sales force and there was a system called certification and the only way you move from a first level to a second level was going through a certification process. And that was a pretty big bump in pay, it was a pretty bump, a big bump in benefits to go from a first level manager to a second level manager. But in order to do that, you had to have qualified sales based on a formula that the company uh, had established and so I was responsible for this large sales force and they would bring me their write-up of these sales and I would sit with them and I would ask them questions about the sale and they would tell me well this is what I did and this is what I found the problem and this is how I solved the problem and this is how I got the deal done and I go okay great and I would sign off on it and send it off to HR they would accumulate the three and then they would promote the person so I get a call one day from the head of human resources and said, we need to meet. And they said, uh, listen, you have a problem. And I said, what problem do I have? And they said, someone in your organization has falsified one of his sales and you're responsible. I said, explain this to me again. One of the people in my organization did something wrong and I'm responsible. How am I responsible? He said, because when you came here, you did not establish an environment which made it so that people would know very clearly that you were not going to tolerate any violations of corporate policy whatsoever. And because you failed to exercise that as a foundational setting, we're holding you responsible. You're going down one level in pay for three months And you're going to have to go back through a management training course about establishing boundaries. This is how the company worked. You know how the company worked. Okay? <clears throat> so I went from a fourth level 
to a third level for three months, pretty big cut in pay, all right? And then I couldn't get out of there fast enough after that. So I was, re- I was, I was a fourth level, and then they offered the first buyout, and you got a one-level bump and two years pay at the new level. So I took a, I went, came out as a fifth level and took the two years pay. I couldn't get out of there fast enough because I couldn't understand the concept. In the natural, it didn't make sense to me. How am I responsible for you, for what you did? Well, <laughs> now I understand it completely, all right? And they were actually right. It's a very strong biblical principle. If you don't establish rules in your household, then you can't deal with every time the kid does something wrong and set a rule because of the behavior. The rule has to be in place for you to be able to measure the behavior and the performance. So unless you establish the standards first, you can't have a consistently performing organization, consistently performing family. You have to set expectations, goals, standards. And so in this case, God had set the standard when he gave him Eve. And he did not exercise his stewardship, the responsibility he had for her welfare. He was not protecting her. He knew exactly because she wasn't there when, he, when God gave Adam the instruction about that tree. He was responsible for conveying the message to her. Now, he may have been the one that said to her, listen, the way we'll do this is, is instead of me telling you not to eat from the tree, I'm going to tell you don't touch the tree and don't eat from it. You know, like the kid in the cake. All right. Uh, you know, better to say don't even go into the territory of that tree. Better to say just stick by the tree of life. As a matter of fact, don't don't leave my sight, you know, which would be the best one. That's when I learned the difference between keeping my eye on the kids and watching the kids. Okay? Somebody would say, would you keep an eye on my kid? All right? You know, there's a difference between watching a kid and keeping your eye on the kid. Okay? Keep your eye on the kid, they can be in the yard somewhere. Watching the kid means... Okay? They want to know everything that's being done. So, it's Adam, not Eve, was held responsible for this for the present human condition. This category contains a a total of four specific provisions of God's judgment on humanity. First, the cursing of the earth. This is a judgment on all humanity. It's just as hard to plow a field in one part of the country as it is another part. Even in the fertile Midlands, even in the fertile Midwest, where the fields are fertile, before they got to be cleared out, somebody had to come there and pull all the rocks out. You know, it's one thing to look at those beautiful fields of corn and sit there and, and uh, drive through at the, right at the height of the season when the stalks are 10 and 12 feet tall and they're just filled with ears and ears of corn and Ma and Pa are sitting there on the, on the, on the deck in the rocker and you, know that, and you walk by and you say, wow, this is, this is the life. This is, this is the dream life. To sit there and look out over all your acreage and all the rows are just nicely lined up. And they say, where were you when the donkey died and we had to hitch the plow to grandma? <laughs> and she had to pull the plow because the rocks were so big it took four of us to move them to the side. You see the borders of our field are lined with these boulders. They all came out of the middle of the field. Where were you 25 years ago, okay, when grandma died, right? And you had to hitch the plow to me because we couldn't afford, because we weren't growing a crop yet, because we were still too busy taking the rocks out of the field. 25 years later, you don't know what the back story is. It's one of the things we do on the program is I get people to tell their back story. I don't want to know, I don't want to know who you are today. I want to know how you got here. I want to know where this started. Uh, we had an interview today with Michelle Pilar, who's a three-time Grammy Award nominee. Uh, unfortunately, we had a bad connection and we rescheduled her for Friday. But she started out as a little girl hiding under a twin bed because her mother was an alcoholic and would buy yardsticks by the hundred and chase after her kids and beat them with yardsticks and break them over. So she, that was a term of remembrance of her childhood. You know, there's some tough beginnings. Here she is now, a three-time Grammy nominee and well-known celebrity and all these things, but started out as a little quivering child with an alcoholic mother hiding under the bed, talking to somebody, thinking God was, lived under the bed. 
because she didn't know anything about God. Her family wasn't a church going, but she would be praying. So she thought whoever it was that was protecting her lived under her bed. That was her concept of who God was. God lived under my bed. So when she got older and she returned back to face her demons, she went back to that house and crawled under that twin bed and she said, God was still there. Okay, but this time I brought him with me. And so the whole dynamic changes. So the curse in the earth, Genesis 3, 17b to 18a, cursed is the ground for your sake and toil shall you eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to you. That which was under man's authority, the ground is now cursed. You remember the water came up from the ground and it was rich and it was loomy and it was easy to plant and it was good for planting and good for bearing fruit and all these wonderful things until the dominion over the earth was handed over to Satan. And now the ground was cursed and the cursed one was now the one who was, had dominion over it. So that which was under man's authority, the ground is now cursed. The aspect of toil is added, and toil shall you eat of it all the days of your life. Labor was part of man's estate before the fall in the Edenic covenant. Now a toilsome aspect is added to the labor. Adam and Eve brought pain into the world. Now they will have painful toil in their respective lives. The curse is symbolized by thorns and thistles in verse 18. Under the Edenic covenant, the earth produced readily and easily. Under the Adamic covenant, the earth now easily produces thorns, thistles, and weeds. They sin by eating, now they will suffer to eat. Just as when Satan was judged, God judged that which was under Satan's authority. Now when Adam is judged, that which is under Adam's authority is judged. Romans 8, 20 to 22 says, The earth also groans, waiting for the messianic redemption. Creation itself is subject to vanity. Verse 20, creation is in bondage of corruption, waiting to be liberated. Romans 8, 21, the whole creation groans and travails in pain until now. Romans 8, 20, verses, uh, I'm sorry, Romans 8, 22. This is the origin of the second law of thermodynamics, the law of disorder and death. The same point is made in Hebrews 1, 10 through 12 and 1 Peter 1, 23. Then we look at the next piece, the human diet. And you shall eat the herb of the field. Man was to remain vegetarian for now. The diet remains the same under the Adamic covenant as it was under the Edenic covenant, although it is not known if this was also true of the animal kingdom. We don't hear of the enmity between man and animal until after the flood, but we don't know just because it's not told to us whether or not there was a change in the dynamic of the food chain and whether or not now man was under the threat of the beast or not. Third, hard labor. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. The toilsome aspect is added to labor. Under the Edenic covenant, labor was easy and without sweat. Under the Adamic covenant, labor is hard. With sweat, the ability to eat will now be based on the work ethic. You don't work, you don't eat. Okay, simple biblical principle. You don't work, you don't eat. All right. Fourth, physical death. Till you return unto the ground, for out of it you are you taken. For dust you are, and unto dust you are, shall return. Hard labor is to continue until the day of his death. The reason is, for dust you are, and under dust you shall return. A point also made in Job 34, 15, Psalm 104, 29, Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Man is pictured as being both dust and clay. Right? Remember, clay is made out of kaolin. Kaolin is a dust of the earth. It's a dusty material. I don't know if you've ever worked with kaolin at all, but that's a part of making clay. So Romans 5, 12, 20, 5, 12 to 21 states, as through one man's sin entered the world and death through sin, and 1 Corinthians 15, 10 to 22 says plainly, as in Adam all die. The rabbis teach that there were also 10 curses upon man. First, his stature was reduced. We're shorter. I can tell you I come from a race of short people. Name one NBA, Jewish, fat, NBA basketball star. J just give me one. Uh, Magic Horowitz. Uh, Wilt the Stilt Rosenthal. 
uh, Larry Bird Cohen. No, we're not a people of tall stature. The tallest Jews are the Ethiopians. Okay? They're the tall ones. Okay? Average height of a Jewish man is about five eight, five eight and a half. Okay? That is below average for the average height of man. Okay? So our stature is smaller. Okay? Uh, so secondly, there was weakness after ejaculation. Third, there were thorns and thistles. Fourthly, there was anguish over earning a living. Fifth, the earth was cursed so that only grass would grow for man to eat. When Adam complained, the fifth curse was replaced by the sixth one, which was sweating from the work. Seventh, glory was removed so another can look on him. Eighth, the serpent's hands and feet were cut off so it no longer was able to do any useful work for man. Ninth, there was the expulsion from the garden. And tenth, there was death and burial in the ground. This is rabbinical teaching. Okay? Now, the cobra stands upright, okay? And a big cobra can stand eye level with you. It just can't move along the ground that way. It has to return to the ground to slither. So this idea of cutting off the hands and feet uh, is not supported in scripture, but it is, makes for a great rabbinical story and a great explanation. And one of the things you, when you are raised up under rabbinical teaching is that uh, you teach the truth of Scripture through illustrative stories and parables. Well, the same way Jesus did. So the actual offense of, of the uh, parables that Jesus gave were exemplars of what was going on around uh, this is a rabbi's making a feeble attempt, in my opinion, of explanation of trying to justify their knowledge, not what the Word of God said. This is eventually what got me on my exploration at age 40 of wanting to know the truth. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. Vayikra ha'adam shem ishto chava kihi hata em kol chai. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. It's the first time he calls her by name. Vaya Sadonai Elohim le Adam ule ishto, quote note, or Vayal Bishem, for Adam and for his wife the Lord God made coats of skins and clothed them. So, what did God do? They were covered with a man-made garment. He had to sacrifice an animal in order to provide the skin of an animal. And he brought the covering for their sin. So we read Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of a thing in the blood and the blood for making atonement. Okay, atonement was considered to be the covering of a sin. You say you are covered by the blood, right? Actually, you're not covered by the blood. You are redeemed by the blood. Okay? It's no longer the blood of bulls and goats or lambs poured out on the altar, but it was a sacrifice of one for all. So I'm not covered by the blood. That would only mean that God could look upon, God could look upon me, but he only could only see me covered in blood. All right? That was a covering for my sin. God can't look upon your sin. If you're in sin, the only thing God can see is the back of your head because you're walking away from him. You can't be in sin walking towards God. That's what repentance is. Repentance is a about face. Okay? Why do we call it about face? Because when I'm, face, I'm in sin, I'm facing the sin. I'm in the sin. My face is in the sin. But when I repent, I have an about face experience and I come then now I can look upon God and God can look upon me all right so he couldn't look upon what became a symbol of their sin their nakedness they attributed that was something to be ashamed of okay that represented their sin so being naked before each other and before anybody else or anything else was considered to be a sin so God could not look upon their sin he made the cover God was our covering our provider even in the beginning so when we talk about robes of righteousness, 
when we, take, when we look at, at garments of praise, when we look at all these references to God clothing us, this takes us all the way back to this event in the book of Genesis in how he clothed them. Vayomer Adonai Elohim hen Adam chaya ki echad mimenu ladaat tov vara veata pen yishlach yado velacha gam meetz ha kaim veachal vechai leolam. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now, what if he put forth his hands and takes also from the tree of life and eats and lives forever? Vashal kehu Adonai Elohim migan Eden, that's the Garden of Eden, laavod et ha'adama asher loka misham. And the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from where he was taken. This was our expulsion from the Garden of Eden. We were expelled. Vaishal Kehu Adonai Elohim Migan Eden La Vod Ed Hadama Asher Lokach Misham. And the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from where he was taken. Vagaresh Ed Hadam Vayashken Mikem Dem Legan Eden. Et hakarum vim, ve et lachat hakerev, hamicha paket, lishmoret, derech et hakain. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. So when we come back next week, we're going to talk about the results of the fall. And we have the name Eve. In Hebrew, it's Chava, uh, which comes from the Hebrew word Chaya, to live, Lachayim. That's the origin of it, of life.